G'day everyone. Day 8, inductor saturation testing. So today I was playing around with a uh, little switch mode buck converter and I um, was trying to make a uh, high power LED um, buck regulator essentially. Um, it, it works, uh, as a matter of fact I can power it up and show you, uh, but I wasn't particularly satisfied with it. Um, when I tried to run, this is just obviously some 20 milliamp LEDs, so I've changed the circuit a bit. It operates at about a megahertz, um, probably closer to 1.8 megahertz actually for this in this particular configuration. But uh, I was having problems with the inductor saturating. So um, excuse my voice. I've been uh, up way too too long today. It's uh, it's already daylight again. So <laughs> uh, I'll be going home very shortly as soon as I finish this video. Okay, so th this this thing works, but I was uh, in order to run higher power as I was using bigger inductors, I was playing around with things, and I was having problems sat saturating the inductors. So I dug out the old inductor saturation test rig. Now I've uh, I've spoken about this before on my website. I think it's about article 200. In the past, many years ago, I made an article on inductor saturation testing. So when I did that, um, I built a nice little box and. Yeah, it doesn't have quite as many features as this one, but this is a slightly more recent version. The microcontroller now has an LED and a button for a couple of different modes, like a single shot mode for testing without overheating the inductor and the rest of the electronics. Um, and um, yeah, like the ability to toggle the, the whole thing on and off, which is handy again for taking uh, measurements without you know heating up the inductor too much. So uh, it's pretty straightforward. The uh, Inductors 101 is basically uh, the voltage across an inductor is uh, proportional to the inductance times the, the time rate of change of the current through it. So that allows us to um, come up with this expression for the um, change of inductance, the change of current through an inductor is proportional to the, um, the voltage inversely proportional to the inductance and proportional to the, the um, time the, that that uh, voltage and has been applied across the inductor. So you can think of this as y equals mx, so the straight line. And so here on the on our graph if we uh, hold voltage constant and inductance doesn't change then with time the current will just ramp up or, or ramp down depending on whether the voltage is positive or negative. But yeah, It's basically a linear um, relation but only at constant voltage and constant inductance. If the inductance changes because say the core material saturates then the slope of this line will change. So that's just what we're shown here. The, the inductor charges up until the core material can no longer provide any more magnetization. So the inductance drops and the slope of the line increases. So obviously L drops, slope increases, and because our mechanism that we're using to, to do this is not an ideal mechanism like we've drawn here, it's more like this circuit here where we've got some voltage source which is a power supply with current limiting, got a capacitor here that's doing its best to keep that as stiffly at whatever that voltage is as possible. In this case it's about 7 millifarads, which is a heck of a lot of capacitance. Um, at some point we'll just run out of current and charge up here and then the voltage will drop and then you'll have this region where the, the thing just tapers off and starts to even drop it. The maximum current that you could test an inductor to in this setup is obviously the, the ohmic resistance of the inductor winding limits the current at maximum. So you've got some set voltage which you can crank up until the, uh, your switch basically blows up. Um, and you know, V equals IR, I equals V on R, simple Ohm's law. To measure the current through the inductor while the switch is on, we've just got a shunt down here, 0.1 um, ohms, so whatever you measure across here, you multiply it by 10 and that's your current. Pretty straightforward. The gate drive just makes sure that it uh, charges the gate capacitance quickly, uh, either when you're you know, turning it on or turning it off, so you snap it on, snap it off, and don't spend too much time in the ohmic region of the switch, which is just a big damn MOSFET. The microcontroller um, has a button and a pot that sets the pot sets the charge time, so the amount of time that you're charging the inductor up for. The longer you have this on for, the you know, obviously the more current is going to flow into that inductor until it either saturates or maybe it doesn't saturate because you just haven't charged it very long. Um, the way I've set it up is the minimum on the pot setting is the shortest time and that, that's kind of the default when the thing comes up so it won't cook the inductor and you have to advance it. Um, it's also got an LED to show you what's happening. Yeah, pretty simple. I'll put the details up on my website. The, the old article's up there. It doesn't, uh, it has the, the gate drive hasn't really changed. Um, the only main difference is the microcontroller firmware and an additional LED and a button. 
So, pretty straightforward way to measure um, torture test inductors. It's, um, well, let's look at the practical circuit. So, here we have an inductor. Um, it's rated at 5 amps. It's a ferrite bobbin um, solenoidal style inductor. It, uh, it's 270 microhenries um, rated inductance. And, okay, let's uh, have a look at on the oscilloscope up here. So if I turn on our uh, inductor saturation measurement, this is the charge time. Um, these are 200 microseconds per div. You can see here it starts at uh, basically zero current and ramps up here to where it saturates and then the uh, inductance is reduced down to, uh, you could actually measure it by putting the cursors on there, we'll, we'll do that for the linear region in a minute, and it, it's at, you know, I can reduce the, uh, the charge time, or increase the charge time, and if I uh, keep increasing the charge time, at some of that's the maximum charge time actually limited by the software. But I'm, at this point I'm starting to run out of the voltage. You can see this is the gate drive and the gate drive is powered by the 12 volt rail. You can see the 12 volt rail sagging here and also look at this, 400 milliamps is being pulled up out of the power supply to run it and that's the average current, not the, the actual duty cycle. If we scroll out here, <laughs> is uh, it's pretty narrow so that's uh, obviously a whole bunch of current being uh, used to charge up that inductor. So, let's put some uh, cursors on here. So let's go down right about here with X1 and X2 up here on the, the linear region. Okay, so delta Y is uh, 700 and well, actually let's turn some averaging on to make it a little bit more accurate. We've got uh, 722 millivolts. which is 7.23 amps obviously, um, so 7.23 amps in 180 microseconds um, so 7 point, no, it's 7.27 it says now after it's average for a little bit longer divided by 180 microamperes equals 40,389 um, amperes per second which makes sense and then we uh, reciprocate that and we multiply it by the power supply voltage which is 12 volts uh, it says 18.8 on there but that's because this power supply is a piece of crap and it doesn't have very good uh, metering I actually measured it with an accurate multimeter so we do that and we find the inductance 297 microhenries which is certainly consistent with an inductor like this as tolerance um, also depends on exactly you can see it suggests a little bit non-linear because ferrite isn't perfectly linear um, core material you can also do the same trick for the uh, the region up here where it's actually saturated Although picking a linear part of it is a little tricky because it's well and truly into saturation there, but let's let's do that. So there's uh, 2.8 amps increase in current over a time scale of 26 microseconds equals 107,000 <laughs> amperes per second. So that's. Um, hundred microhenries, 111 microhenries, so you can see the inductance has decreased quite a bit as it saturates. Okay, so that's pretty straightforward. Um, simple, easy way to, to qualify inductors up to a certain current. This, uh, this peak current here, if we just move the um, X1, X1 cursor down to the knee region, we can see that's around 7.8, almost 8 amps. Yeah, so the, this inductor was rated to 5 amps and clearly had some margin as where it's at, to its saturation point. 
Okay, so now I'm going to take a magnet, a normal, um, you know, reasonably strong um, nib magnet. I'm going to bias the core magnetization with this DC externally applied magnetic field. So down here, I'm going to take the magnet and I'm going to approach, and I can feel the magnetic field pulling on the magnet as I approach it, it's buzzing in my fingers. So I'm going to approach it in one direction with one pole, I'm going to turn around and approach it with the other. So what will happen is the magnetic field, the external magnetic field will either oppose or augment the magnetization inside the, or the field inside the inductor, so the magnetization will saturate either, you know, earlier or later. Okay, so let's go back up here. And, okay, so here, now let's turn averaging off so we can actually see it happen in real time. Okay. So here I've you know, <laughs> stuck the magnet to the coil, and as I approach the coil, I'm bucking the field basically, and its magnetization saturates later. Okay, so I turn the magnet around, it'll saturate sooner. So what I'm essentially doing is, if you imagine the hysteresis curve, I'm I'm moving the center point up and down so it has more direction to go in one way or the other through, um, you know, through the the origin in the the magnetization curve. It's uh, it's not particularly good for the magnet or probably for the core to do this, but it's an interesting demonstration to show you what what's actually happening um, inside the core. So you could push these things to operate at higher currents by running them uh, with a, you know, maybe a, another winding that pushed the core of magnetization one way or the other. When I was playing with this, uh, with this particular inductor, I found a curious um, effect. I put the magnet on here and I'd, uh, I'd obviously induce some kind of remnant magnetization in the core, which probably changed its reluctance, and it would have like a memory, it's a bit like a, you know, a bit of core amp. And in single shot mode, it was it was evident the first time you tried to magnetize it one way or the other, you'd see uh, a shift in the in the saturation point, even essentially like changing or changing the um, the core. Um, I guess you you could say it's like changing the reluctance in the core, putting a gap in the core, but even though I'm magnetizing it in a different axis, so that the materials. Actually, I don't know if these ferrites are, are made isotropic or not. I doubt they'd be I doubt they'd be polarized with a magnetic field while you know on annealed or anything like that. It'd be too too expensive I would imagine to do that. So they're probably isotropic. But obviously um, you could grain orient them maybe by letting annealing them in a magnetic field. I don't know some ferrites I imagine are, are done well and other magnetic materials have that done to them to improve their performance. But uh, anyway that's an interesting different topic at some point. Uh, okay, so the uh, the switcher obviously didn't make it for today's video and uh, actually ended up playing with it for far more hours than I wanted to, but I thought this would be an interesting diversion to talk about uh, inductor saturation. Even though I've done a couple of things on it in the past, this is kind of a more complete treatment of it. I'll, um, I think I'll go home now and regroup and uh, try and come up with something different and interesting for tomorrow. As usual, um, please ask any comments, uh, questions in the comments. I will uh, link stuff in the description as I do it. I'll, uh, I'll shoot upload the firmware and uh, etc. to my website because it's uh, it's kind of nice to have that on-off feature. And I'll have a more detailed circuit diagram there as well. There's already one there for the uh, the old version that didn't have the button or anything. You can feel free to look at that in the meantime until I get round to writing up because we know how good I am at writing up these things. Okay, um, until then, bye.